Well, church, good morning. God bless you. I'm thankful that we're here together again on this day as we venture further into uh, this series of how to study the Bible. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little tired this morning, and uh, it's a good tired. Uh, my family and I, we went down to L.A. In the last few days uh, to celebrate my father-in-law, just as uh, dad, uh, his retirement from the LAPD after 31 years, and it was pretty amazing to see and uh, I was asked to give the invocation prayer for that um, time. And it was just an amazing moment, very emotional, of course, uh, for the family. Um, uh, Jessica has not known her father to be anything else but a police officer and a servant to her community. And so uh, it was very evident to see the legacy that he is leaving behind in that department. And so I'm very proud to be his son. And so, um, but that involved a lot of driving uh, between the last few days. And so, and I don't know if you've taken a trip recently, if or you can remember um, a family trip that you've taken. And I wonder, how do you pass the time in those family trips? Is it uh, electronics? Is it a book? Is it audio tape? Uh, um, for family, you know, a lot of us, I'm sure we play little games in the car, right? The alphabet game, which I usually win, and the, uh, the license plate game, slug bug until someone's arm is just completely numb, right? Well, uh, my family and I, we play this game which is called Talk for People. And Talk for People is something that I've kind of just always done ever since I started driving. And it's just part of my creativity and kind of funny humor. Well, I think it's funny. But um, when you talk for people, it happens when, um, uh, well, there's one rule with this. You can't say anything mean. You can't say anything to mean about the people that you observe. And so what happens is when you observe people on the road, you have to tell a story about what's going on with them, right? Like if they're at a crosswalk and they're looking really anxious, you know, we might, we might give a voice in his head like he left the iron on at home. He's got to make sure his house isn't burning down. Or if some like just tough guy is like next to us and he's bumping the music, right? And we just like start singing for him a Disney princess song, you know? Like that's, that's the thing. You know, I'm not going to do it right now. So. <laughs> But we always just have like these little kind of like scenarios and one-liners and they just crack us up and it's just a way to just pass the time. And you know, there's just one thing that's really missing from the poor unfortunate souls that meets our family car and our boredom um, is that we may have all these little indications as we look into their lives, you know, for just a split moment. We may have an understanding of what they may be going through, but we have no idea what they're thinking. We have no idea what they're hoping for. We have no idea what's on their minds. We have no idea what brought them to that moment of crossing paths with us. So we're missing something really important, and that is the context. What is their context? We have no idea. And so we need to know that, and I think that's really important. And we have no idea what has brought them to cross our paths, but we know that God does. Just like, I don't know all that's going on in the room today, but God does. You have a context and a setting of what's going on in your life. And then I can only, we can only observe so much of what's going on and taking place, unless we know more. Amen. As we're moving through this Bible series, we started with the uh, SOAP acronym. And this is our scriptural Bible study method. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. We went through Scripture last week, and if you didn't hear it or, uh, or see it or wasn't here, you can catch it on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, and today we're going to be going through observation. We're going to be looking at what do we observe when we're reading the Bible. And so it's so important. And when it comes to reading the Bible, its narratives and its text, we can also do the same thing like playing that little game that we play. We can read a verse... We can study a section of maybe prophecy. Maybe we can read a really difficult line in the book of Job. Most of them are difficult lines, by the way. And we can maybe think we have a grasp on what this is to apply to our life or even a window back to what it means about God. Well, the thing is, if we don't have the context, if we don't have the setting of why those words and what we are reading are there, then we can really easily step into ideas and beliefs and suddenly the Word of God is leveraged as maybe proof text that certain people can bring into our lives to leverage legalism. We can 
He wrote it of grace, can twist it, and it suddenly is being applied for what it was never intended to be written. And that's all if we don't have the context. And sometimes people that I've met are, are living in strongholds and bondage in their life because someone took some scripture and they twisted it a little bit, just enough, to leverage some pain, to leverage some guilt, to remove hope, to eradicate grace. And it's been really challenging for people to overcome that. Now there is scripture in the Bible that we need to understand. There are parts of what God is saying that He is the all-powerful judge. But sometimes we twist things and we don't get the right mindset. We don't understand that, that Scripture is not maybe, maybe trying to get us to live a holy living, or but sometimes people use it so that we are conforming to what their ideals are or what, what they are afraid of. We step in line with and we don't step out of it. Can be, it can be part of spiritual abuse, which does exist. So let us not forget that even though the devil doesn't speak truth, as a liar, he does twist the truth. Remember that. He can't create truth. That's not in him. It only exists in God. But he's really good at getting it twisted up in your mind and your heart. So be aware of that. And so this twisting can have us take that portion, a phrase, and it can either justify actions or beliefs that are really just colliding with the Word of God and God's heart and have us completely walk away from it at times. So when we don't have the lens to see the full setting of Scripture we're reading, we can actually be, I think, unnecessarily interpreting the words to mean something completely different than what they were intended for us to receive them for. Like, for example, well, what I want you to know first is this, that reading Scripture in context helps us to correctly interpret meaning. So when you approach the Word of God, you need to ask, what's the setting? What am I reading? What part of the Bible? What am I reading? Because reading it out of context twists or erodes its meaning. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. There's a lot of fun examples, and so I, I was having a hard time picking some. Like, for example here, when we read Luke 22, 60, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. What's Jesus talking about? What's he talking about, Jesus? Right? We can read that, man, Peter doesn't know what God is saying. How can I know what God is saying if I just read that verse? It can be discouraging to think, if Peter's this confused, what am I going to do? The guy who was the rock of the church, right? Well, look what happens if we add one more line to the end of that. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Oh, this was after Jesus was arrested. This was when he was denying the Lord three times as Christ predicted. And when that happened, we see that actually this crowing and, and Peter denying Jesus was part of that deconstruction that Jesus already knew was going to take place in Peter's life. Peter needed to be broken down. And later, Jesus knew that he would reinstate him and rebuild him and edify him. But we have to read that this happens even to the leaders of our church. They fail like we fail. And so we're able to read part of that story to then read further and see when God, when Jesus reinstates Peter. And that's a message of hope for us when we blow it, right? That we, if we can take it in context, when we can get a good lens that Peter is a man who fails like the rest of us, then that gives us hope that we can identify that God is all-knowing and He has a purpose and a plan even when we mess up and deny Him. So that's very important. Another one, one more, is, is something like this. Ecclesiastes 10.19. If we just read this and ran with it, it would be a really different place today. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry. And money is the answer for everything. <laughs> what version are you reading? I'm reading the NIV, y'all. And if we just read that, we, we could justify a lot. Right? <laughs> well, Ecclesiastes 10 <laughs> <laughs> right? It's Super Bowl Sunday, so... No. Here's the thing. 
we need to see it in its setting. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 10 was writing a narrative which the title of Ecclesiastes 10 is this, Wisdom is greater than folly. Oh, 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 these are the words of what a fool says. A fool says a feast is made for life, for wine makes life merry, and, and, and money is the answer for everything. Oh, he's giving us a clue of what is the difference between wisdom that pleases God and folly that leads to destruction. Sorry, I'll try to ignore some of the disappointed faces in the room this morning. <laughs> so we need to know the context, the setting, the purpose, so that we can understand the meaning of the passage. And it's so important to know basic background of what you are reading. Now, I know there's readers in the room, and we even have started a, a, um, a book club, one of our groups. And so, none of us, I don't think, have ever started reading a book right in the middle of it, right? <laughs> Unless you're like, I just want you through it to say I'm done with it until they get off my back. But, no, we don't do that. We start at the beginning. So why would we treat the Bible story narrative any differently? We need to be able to read through it, to know its truth and its setting. And that is no small task. It's supposed to be a devotion that lasts a lifetime. Amen. So we should learn the historical background of the text when we read Lamentations. Why are they lamenting? Oh, because they lost Jerusalem. They are an exiled people. That helps me to understand a little bit. Who the author is? Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Oh, Solomon. Who's Solomon? He was a king. Why was he so knowledgeable? Because he asked God for wisdom, right? Okay, who, who is the writer author? Well, who is the author writing to? All the new church, all the exiled people, all, all these things. It helps us to know, oh, it's directly to God. David's writing to God. And there's some additional important factors when we properly evaluate the passage, its cultural context, its genre. Is it a historical book? Is it a prophetic book? Is it a song? Is it a letter? Is it a historical account? What form are we reading? Because it's all different. And it's put together to help us see and understand what it means to be a part of this grand narrative of God redeeming the world through Jesus Christ. So that's important. What's the, is it literal or figurative writing? That's important to know too. All these little questions need to be answered before you just randomly open up the word and go, that works, done, you know. We need, we need to be intentional. So having this information with tools, there's tools out there to help us find the meaning prevents us from inserting our own message into the words of God that we understand and proclaim that God breathed for His church. So it lets what the text says to influence your life, not what you want the text to say, so that it preserves what you got going on and you are able to mind your own business. It's a big difference. Right? So, do you observe only in the Bible that which is affirming your ideas and ways? Or is it informing you about God's ways and will and wants? It's a big question. Because sometimes we go, I need a verse about getting through fear. I need a verse about, you know, like we get really, like, really picky. Oh, that's not good enough. That means I gotta, like, surrender. Oh, that's not good enough. That means I gotta pray. Oh, that's not good enough, right? We want to give me an easy scripture, God. You know, now we we need to be able to read the word for what it's saying, and so, so what are some tools that we can use? Well, there's lots out there. There's Bible dictionaries. There's a concordance, which gives you understandings of what words and what they mean and what their value was. Um, there's a um, biblical understanding of biblical language, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, um, being able to know what does that mean. If it says this, it also implies these other meanings, which helps you give get a better understanding of what you're reading, especially the Old Testament. Uh, reading different versions of the Bible, whether it's NIV, ESV, the Message, you know, we're able to kind of compare and go, okay, I'm getting an idea of what the author was saying. I can apply that now if I observe some trends or some other words that help us to know what we're saying here. And so I wanted to give you a tool today that you can go online and find. And so uh, Strong's Concordance is a great resource. It's been around a long time. And so if you go to blueletterbible.org, it's a great place to just really have a lot of tools at your fingertips. 
Um, I know with Bible Gateway and new version apps, they have some other ones on there too, but uh, Blue Letter Bible is a good one. And so it's a great way to just have something to go. I don't get this song. Help me. I don't understand this verse in Revelation. Help me. Um, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to go, I don't get it. Let me look a little harder. <laughs> and don't give up on that. So, and so all of this is so that you and I can have a right understanding of the meaning in the context so that it gives us a sure footing and a firm understanding of truth. That's what you want, right? That's what I want. Okay, one person kind of nodding. Good. Okay, them and I, we want that. I hope you all want that too at some point. And so to practice some of this today, we're going to take our main text. And it's going to come out of 2 Timothy, out of chapters 2 and 3. And so let me give you some of the context of this book. So the setting is this, is that this is an epistle or letter from the author Paul, or the apostle Paul. Paul was formerly called Saul. He was a Pharisee, and he dropped all that on the road to Damascus, and he came face to face with Christ. And so he's the one that gave the message of the gospel to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And so he is writing to Timothy. And Timothy was Paul's protege. Mr. Miyagi, karate kid. Okay, got that good. And Timothy grew up as a believer. And he was part of some of the first waves of the believing church of the way. And so Paul and Timothy traveled and evangelized and planted churches and they endured hardship and persecution together. Timothy, to Paul, was like a son. And he was very invested and very interested in what Timothy was going to accomplish for God. And so this letter comes from Paul when Paul himself was in prison. And his intention was to strengthen this young minister who was facing trials and fallouts and controversy. And there was this great threat that he was going to be discouraged. And Paul couldn't have that. He didn't want this young minister to be discouraged and all that was taking shape. It's amazing to think that Paul's intention was to strengthen him and encourage him while he himself was in chains, right? It's pretty amazing to think about that. I mean, doesn't knowing that about this book give it just more meaning and depth when we read it? And I go, this is the setting. This is when it was read. I think it's important to know. So we're going to read... 2 Timothy chapter 2, 16 through 3, 17. It says this. Paul writes, Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like Dan Greek. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, those who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, and this comes out of Numbers, the Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Amen. And in a large house, there are articles that not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do His will. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, and have Shaley read that later, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, 
without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of good, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected, but they will not get very far because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Wow. And this is Paul's charge to his young minister. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Wow. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know these from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is god breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. That's a mouthful, huh? It's a good charge. Could you imagine getting that letter from your spiritual father? Him writing such words of instruction to you, knowing that he was in change and in prison. He could die, but yet he had that care for you. Be reverent and understanding what you've been given from God. The wisdom being passed down from experience and integrity and obedience to the ways of God the Father is pretty amazing. And we can observe a lot from these words to this young Timothy. We see that those who twist the truth, as in verse 17, that such a teaching isn't this kind of isolated thing. It doesn't have its own just kind of, okay, they're just crazy, don't bother them, don't listen to them. But in verse 17, it, it, it teaches us that such false teaching is like gangrene. It spreads, it rots, it erodes the truth. It rots the heart of faith when one stands on the ideas that they're out of line with God. It destroys it. And in this case, two imposters' disciples were teaching that the resurrection of the dead and the, and the return of Jesus had already come. You all missed it. What are you waiting for? I think we have a lot of that today certain ways. What are you waiting for? It's not relevant. What are you hoping for? And I think that's the case if we take the work of God out of context. If we twist it. Hope becomes dread. Grace becomes legalities. And Jesus goes from Savior to this obscure idea that is one option of many in the world. The life of a faithful follower is to not judge the outcome of God's promises by the type of circumstances they are set before them as we walk through them to realize them. No, we hold on to the promise of hope with a clear observation of what the Bible says. We read it, we observe it, we study it, and then we are going to apply it, which we'll get to next week. We hold on to the hope that what was encouraged by Paul as he quoted Numbers which was Moses, that the Lord knows who are His. We are His. Hallelujah. And if He knows us, Hallelujah. He sees what we're under. He sees what we're up against. Amen. And if we know what we're up against, if we know what we're under, what oppresses us, what challenges us, what stifles us, then we're also reminded that Jesus has overcome it all. Hallelujah. And in that truth, we're given hope. We can be encouraged by Paul's words here as well. And so we have to ask the question, are we His? Are we God's? 
Do we have the promises of God or the doubts of skeptics reigning in us? Who's at the helm more? God's truth or the world's skepticism? And that the foundation of God in this world isn't determined by what we say or deny. Whether it is two false disciples in the first century church, a family member who mocks you because you're talking about your faith, a blog headline on medium.com that I read that claims that Christianity is irrelevant to the world. They may sound persuasive to us, they may seek to afflict our hope, but the foundation that we set on is understanding the Word of God more clearly for how it was written and how it wasn't meant to instruct or inform us. And when we gain those observations with a clear mind and setting of our foundation, on our convictions, our resolve to not compromise becomes such a stark difference between what we're living and what the rest of the world is confused about. We start to live with more purpose, more intention. Because the world not only takes God out of context, they've taken God out of their context. He doesn't exist. But for us, we must maintain a clear foundation of what He is saying and what He is meaning in His Word. So the life of living in the context of biblical understanding is rooted in this. It's rooted in flee and pursue. That's what Paul is instructing Timothy here. Flee from evil desires. Not just kind of mingle with them at the party. You know? No, flee from them. Flee from them. Desires that oppose, rebel, doubt, and give into, the, into that which leaves the word ineffective in us and unable to take root in every little decision. I recall sitting really early one morning in a hotel room. Uh, I was part of um, a Christian music festival called Joshua Fest. I think it's in Quincy. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a great festival. Um, and I got up really early and I was in this hotel room eating the beautiful, amazing continental breakfast. And I you know, like, is there any more? You know, you can ask me. And I'm sitting at the table over my bagel and the miniature yogurt, you know, that they give you. And there was three very um, wise Christians uh, next to me. And you know when you're kind of doing your thing and the conversations behind you or next to you start pulling your attention, right? And you're like, no, I want to focus on my bagel. But they just keep saying things that kind of keep drawing your mind away, you know. Well, that was happening, and what they were talking about was they were talking about how many times in their church they've saved the day. They saved the day because they, on more than one occasion, have had to help their poor pastor. They had to help their poor pastor because more than once he has mispronounced biblical words in front of the church. <laughs> oh, so thankful that they were there. <laughs> And it's really funny, because I think about that. You know, there are people who uh, really focus on little things. And if I quote Paul here, uh, when they engage in stupid arguments, yeah, they kind of get interesting. And so I was just thinking about that, you know. I remember them saying, he was saying, pro chorus, it's prochorus, come on. You know? Okay, I don't even know what that means. So, what can you do? You know? I'm glad you got that going for you. So instead of that, I would have wanted to say to them, okay, yeah, besides that, but what was the scripture? What was the message? What was the result of all that time that your pastor poured into you? Amen. That wanted to teach you, that wanted to reveal something to you, that wanted you maybe not to hear his words, but hear the truth and have something take shape in you. But here you are up in the mountains going, <laughs> pro quarters. <laughs> You're like, that's not the point of this. Let's not leverage it against one another. So we have to, to flee from such things. Amen. Amen. And I raise that because we need to flee from the areas that are not useful for us. They waste our time. Whether we say Dorcas correctly, which is a disciple in the Bible, okay? <laughs> Iconium, we need to know, to not use those words against one another. We must pursue righteousness. Flee from those things and pursue righteousness. And in this letter, we see that Paul seeks to remind Timothy of how the scriptures are able to bring wisdom if they're practiced out 
like Timothy observed him. Timothy observed Paul having a life of purpose and faith and patience and love and endurance and persecutions and sufferings. That's the result if we pursue righteousness. The result is if we don't flee from silly arguments. Because we're just laughing at each other as the church. You know, there's so many people laughing at us. We shouldn't be laughing at each other, right? We need to really be pursuing righteousness and truth and building one another up. So this morning, to bring our mind around some ideas about being able to observe the setting and the connections of the text, we need to understand and have a firm grip on the reality of what the scriptures form and what their purpose is. And there's four key ideas I want you to walk away with this morning when you observe scripture. The first is that I want you to be able to see the heart of God when you're reading the Word. When we have the right context of what the Word is saying, we understand it's rooted in the Old Testament setting. We understand that its purpose was for what? To give an accounting of Jesus' life. Then we're able to observe what Jesus did. He sought to restore, not condemn. That as we make connections of maybe culture that took place, history, prophecies, that they are revealed to us, that, that we see that God is active as we read them. We trust that the Holy Spirit is present when we start to apply them. And that the Son, all the while, is advocating for us to make a step closer day by day in faith and maturity until that moment we meet Him face to face. Amen. We are to know Scripture in its right context and meaning so that we get familiar with our God. He becomes more acquainted. He knows us completely. But we need to continue to go further and further to know Him in greater depths. The second is if we have the right context that we are granted repentance. And I say that we're granted repentance because that as we observe how God deals with His nation Israel and how over and over and over again after exile, after famine, after discipline, God restores. God protects them. God builds them up. And God pursues them just the same. And so when we read that, that gives us a picture that God is a good, good Father. Yes. Wanting to pursue you over and over again. Oh, how God does this in us. Yes. And when, when we're granted repentance, we're able to see that God is pursuing us and that we want to do an about face. And that's what repentance means. We turn from. We turn away from the things that were not pleasing to God. And we turn to Him. And we're granted that opportunity to say, you're right, Lord, I need to come back to you. Thank you that you restore me and redeem me again. And you, you, you heal me and you make it right by my faith and my repentance. And we can see that when we read Scripture in context. The third thing I want you to hold on to this morning is that when we read the Bible in context, we are led to knowledge. Knowledge is so important. Some of the reason why we have Proverbs and Ecclesiastes is because... When Jerusalem lost the temple, when Israel lost the temple in Jerusalem, excuse me, they felt that they lost their connection to God. The tabernacle was no more. God didn't dwell with them. And so they came up and they started to personify wisdom. Proverbs, they felt if they could apply enough wisdom, they would become closer to God. But we trust and know that God is active. And so therefore, we understand that, that we, if we practice scriptures, we are led to knowledge. Knowledge in God. And we have that grip on what is pleasing. And if we trust God's heart, we are more ready to adopt and seek knowledge that comes from Him. Wisdom and discernment that keeps us in step and ready to be available to receive His blessing and to be a blessing to one another. Amen. And we discover that as we apply these truths, new truths and revelation about God that Paul says was demonstrated to him, we start to see in our own life a life of purpose and faith and patience and love and endurance and, and persecutions and sufferings. We have purpose because it's fueled by heaven. We have patience because he has patience for us. We have love because we realize we've been given his son. And endurance for we know that the spirit refreshes us. 
and persecution because we understand that the flesh opposes the spirit. And we suffer not in vain or unseen by God. That there are opportunities God sets by our trials and our enduring faith during suffering. And the, there is wisdom to see that God can take those who are afflicted and use them for a larger good, a larger impact. They, you may be walking through stuff or you may have gotten through some things and you may go, what purpose does that serve, God? Maybe you haven't arrived at it yet. But you have to trust that God is in the business of redeeming and restoring the days that were lost to suffering and persecution. I know that standing here as a witness to that in my life. God will use it. If you pursue Him in knowledge, He will grant you that discernment to apply it in kingdom building. Amen. And the fourth thing is that we are able to escape the traps of the enemy. Oh, the enemy wants to trap you. Like a, dawn in, in, uh, a doe in the forest wants to just snatch him, right? With his tricks. And when we read the word in context, we have these observations we, and these accounts, and we can see of, that are evil and of the enemy. We can see that the devil, we can anticipate him, we can, we can pray against him, we can call out to each other when a trap has been set for us, when a temptation is present. And if you think a temptation can't take you down, then you've already bought the hook of the lie. You've got to be careful. Amen. If you think that a temptation can't take you down, then you already are on your way. Because that's usually what happens is you go, I'm untouchable, like you're 18 again, right? Nothing's going to happen to me. And then something happens. You get tripped up. A trap can be laid to ruin your marriage, your career, your finances, to get you distant between you and your kids or your grandkids. I think some of the primary traps of the enemy is to get distance between you and God and you and your family. Amen. Get you isolated. One of the biggest lies of the enemy is to say you're alone in your struggle. Amen. No one understands you. No one else is struggling like you're struggling. You're <laughs> such a whatever. That's a lie. Amen. That's a trap. And so when you start hearing those, you go, that's not the voice of truth. Hello. I'm not going to endure that. Because I have the Word of God in context telling me that I am beloved. That I'm redeemed. Right. The Spirit of God lives in me. That I'm accepted. That I can call upon the church. Brothers and sisters who know me. And I can call upon you, God, who knows me best. Amen. And we can be wise, wise, and we can read the signs, and that we can be versed in His schemes. And we can be outfitted with tools of prayer and character and practice so that we can bring the kingdom of heaven to increase over our context than any trap that the enemy wants to set. So may we, if we practice these four, may we see the heart of God. May we be granted the gift of repentance, be led to knowledge, and escape threats because we are able to observe and understand and have the tools that set meaning to the words that we draw from when we read the Bible. Instead of just applying our own cracked lens of the world. May God be with us as we read the word. And may we acquire tools and practices that provide clear interpretations of what is historical and what is practical. And, and how Jesus bridged the law for us to live in grace. Hallelujah. All so that we stand on this firm foundation that we have scripture that brings us a new life that endures. I'm so thankful for God's word. I, I hope that you're thankful for God's word. I hope that it's something that's really practical in your life. That it isn't an app that's like on the back page of all your apps that you don't use, you know? That it's maybe in your favorites or your Bible is by your bed or by your coffee pot or wherever it is. I pray that it's very accessible for you. That you seek to understand a little more of what you're reading and why it's in this book. Amen. Why is it one of the 66 books? Why? Why is that? How the Spirit can be revealed. And how when we as a church practice the different parts of our life as a church, we can read Scripture and go, why does it have meaning for us? As we move to the sacrament, 
we're able to read why it was given to us. It was given and established so that we could have something tangible as God's grace for us. Amen. Amen. As we move to communion, we are encouraged to have our hope that not only did God come, not only did the Word dwell among us and become flesh, but that the Lord is coming again. And that He is our hope. We read in God's Word that as Jesus and His disciples were preparing, they were preparing to celebrate Passover. And in the upper room, gathered, He wanted to give them something to remember Him. So the night that Jesus was betrayed with His disciples, He took bread and He gave thanks to God and he broke it. And he said, take this and eat. For this bread given to you is my body. Broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to God. And he said, take this and drink. For this cup is a symbol of a new covenant. Sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so now as we are informed by Scripture, we are encouraged to practice this, for we are His disciples. Amen. And we are able to practice the same hope today. The hope that not only did Jesus' passion life, His death, crucifixion, and resurrection are our hope and assurance of salvation. And not only that, we have hope that He will return again. And we'll be ready for it. Hallelujah. I'll invite the ushers forward now. And what we'll do is we'll take communion. I'll pray here in just a moment. And you're invited. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is your meal. This is the meal of God's people. And in a moment, I'll, after I pray, you can come forward to form two lines. You can exit. You can pray at the altars. You can pray in your seat. You can consume immediately or you can wait for me to leave. So let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for these elements. God, may they be for us symbols of your blood and your body. May we ingest them and be reminded of your tangible love in our lives. Thankful for your word, God. Thankful for the Spirit. Thankful for the Son. Thankful for you, Father. May us who come before this table devote our faith and practice an understanding that we want to know you we want to understand your heart, God. We want to be granted repentance. And we also want to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. May he be binded up by your name, Jesus. And may us as the church, your body, be fruitful and prosperous as we trust you and seek to live out the words of Scripture. God, we thank you and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. The meal of God for the people of God. Come forward all to our faith.